Great. Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Craig Scott. I'm a professor of law uh, at Osgood Hall Law School. And I have the pleasure to have helped organize uh, this event we're calling Ottawa and the Emergencies Act, a big round table. It's a big round table in the primary sense of 12 to 13 round tablers, participants. Also, we do have a whole um, huge audience of folks who are joining us here today. And um, your participation will of necessity be mostly passive listening, but we do have the chat in Zoom open. And you're welcome to send questions and comments, which all of the participants can see, as in the, the contributors can see as co-hosts. And they may be able to work in responses or uh, indirect responses sometimes to some of your questions and comments. Uh, they have to manage their own distraction levels because they're going to be listening to each other as well. So there are no guarantees exactly uh, what might strike the fancy of a participant but do feel free to contribute in the chat box, but you might wanna wait until after any given individual is finished. If it sparks a question or comment, then send it then. Um, we have a, 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 an order that will go in two rounds um, where uh, we will go for a designated period of time and then go for somewhat shorter time the second uh, time around. We've left enough flex that there might be time for a little bit of organic um, engagement that is off script, so to speak, but we really do have to watch the clock. We end at seven o'clock. Um, so we are here to discuss various dimensions of the, uh, the Emergencies Act, its recent invocation, and of course, all the circumstances surrounding it, as well as parallel debates uh, and legal proceedings that relate to some of what uh, sparked the invo invocation of the act. Uh, civil injunctions, administrative uh, law injunctions. Um, and we're really lucky to have a, a few practicing lawyers who are behind those injunctions with us today. Part of the purpose is to see what can be done with the regular law uh, in, in ways that didn't need the Emergencies Act, but also just to see uh, whether or not uh, the law's capacity to deal with what has been going on um, is adequate in some respects or not. Um, the, the next thing to note is that we can't be comprehensive. There's in some topics we just decided we weren't going to cover uh, civil forfeiture. We might have an entire new panel on that within the next couple of months, just as an example, but anybody who wants to bring it up can bring it up, but uh, there's, there's, there's gaps. We as a group of 12 or 13 will not be comprehensive, and each individual has been asked not to worry about leaving a lot out. They've only got five to six to seven minutes of the time, okay? Um, and the final thing is, well, we've got competition. I understand there either is a press conference going on, a ministerial conference going on, or will be very shortly, where CBC predicts that the uh, invocation, the proclamation will be withdrawn. So it's quite obvious the Prime Minister heard about our event, um, and uh, we've, we've had an impact already. Anyway, the, the fact of the matter is uh, these issues will not be will not go away. Um, the, the length of time will become a relevant factor, obviously. So with no further ado, I'm going to start us off with our first uh, speaker, my colleague, Professor Francois Tonguay Renault, who's an associate professor uh, of law here at Osgood, uh, former director of the Nathanson Center in Transnational Human Rights, Crime and Security, which is sponsoring this event and who uh, is lucky to have as its executive assistant, Liel Gonsalves, who's running uh, everything behind the scenes for us. He's also starting a new uh, a certificate in emergency law at Osgood uh, that starts on March 26th and has been um, advising in a pro bono capacity uh, uh, various groups looking to challenge um, the, the act or its invocation. Francois is going to give us a bit of an overview of the Emergencies Act. Francois. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Craig. I wrote my doctorate on emergencies and legality in Oxford in the 2000s. At the time, emergency legislation was run of the mill in some countries, but not ours. Uh, it was not a mode of governance in Western societies, just from time and again. Um, we've seen in the last few years that given the era of converging crisis in which we live, climate change, rising civil instability, and pandemics, 
Um, this is now with us to stay. And this is why it all is good for the last two years. We've been working on this new program on the law of emergencies. I know there are a lot of you know, lawyers, uh, lawyers here uh, in the uh, audience who may want to consider this. Um, it might be the end of an emergency, which was the one of many in the last few uh, in the last few months, and there will likely be more uh, in the coming months and years. So I don't think we're out of this, even though this emergency has been revoked. So as Craig just mentioned, we decided to start by just giving you a little overview of the Emergencies Act, um, just so that uh, we are able to frame the discussion today. I'm going to try to do this uh, rapidly. You have the slides on the website if you want to refer back to them. So the Emergencies Act, as we know this, which uh, as we know it uh, today was enacted in 1988. Uh, so it's not recent anymore, but it's the first time, um, 14th of February was the first time in which it had been invoked since its enactment. So until then, um, of course, Canada had, had faced various uh, crises, disasters, including pandemic, but also uh, blockades, economic uh, downturns, etc. The government had decided to deal with them through normal laws, or at least by but through existing laws, or, or, or by enacting new laws, including around the time of the um, of September 11 and the terrorist attacks um, on uh, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, right? So, but we I didn't have an invocation of the Emergencies Act until um, a few days ago. So how is the Emergencies Act structures for, is structured around four types of national uh, emergencies. And so the government has to declare a particular kind of emergency if it wants to avail itself of the powers that can be invoked under the act. These four emergencies all have an initial threshold to clear, which is that the emergency needs to be a national uh, emergency. So that basically tracks uh, the definition of emergency that was given by the Supreme Court in the inflation reference. You have three set of criteria. It cannot be effectively dealt with under any other law of Canada. Um, the situation is urgent and critical. It was of a temporary nature. And at least one of the following, uh, that is that it seriously endangers the life's health or safety of Canadians and is of uh, such proportions uh, or nature as to exceed um, the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it, or seriously threatens the ability of the government of Canada to preserve the sovereignty, security, and territorial integrity of Canada. Now, we're going to discuss that today. These criteria seem to give a lot of scope to the government uh, to interpret them, uh, but might also give a hook for later judicial review. Now, I said that each of these four types of emergency needs to be a national emergency, but then the government needs to invoke one of the specific ones. In this case, the federal government does invoke a public order emergency. A public emergency is defined in the act as an emergency that arises from threats to the security of Canada. And that is so serious as to be a national emergency. What is a threat to the security of Canada? That's defined in the CSIS Act. And you have here the kind of things that may represent such an emergency, acts of espionage and sabotage, foreign, foreign influence activities that uh, might be harmful to the interests of Canada, they're clandestine or deceptive, uh, activities that are related to serious violence against persons or property for the purpose of achieving a political, religious, or ideological goal, ideological goal, sorry, or activities directed to destroy or overthrow by violence the Canadian constitutional order. But note that excludes lawful advocacy, protest, or dissent, right? Uh, now, the first step is that the government has to declare uh, one of these emergencies um, to be a national emergency. Uh, and so we've seen this happen. The federal cabinet made a formal proclamation which had to specify the state of affairs constituting the emergency, the kind of measures that it was uh, uh, adopting, uh, and insofar it didn't apply to the whole country, we'd have to say, well, here are the specific areas to which it applies. In this case, we had a pan-country uh, emergency that was proclaimed. Uh, and to issue the proclamation, and that might be another hook for later judicial review, the cabinet has to believe on reasonable grounds that one of the four types, in this case, a uh, um, public order emergency exists and that it necessitates the taking of uh, special temporary measures for dealing with the emergency. Uh, now, the provincial governments have a role. Uh, in the case of uh, a national, sort of pan-national emergency, which affects many province, provinces, the federal cabinet has to consult the provinces. This happened, they don't need to say yes, they just need to be consulted. It'd be different if it were an emergency that applied to just one province there, the province would need to, to consent. Um, parliament then has a role, and we've seen this happen uh, earlier this week. The, the parliament has to confirm 
the proclamation of emergency within uh, seven days in this case, right? So uh, there are different procedures for this, but we've seen that played out uh, in the media recently. Uh, this then gives cabinets extraordinary powers. These powers are, as it were, enforced from the time of the proclamation of the emergency. Uh, and if the emergency is not um, sort of sanctioned by, by the House, uh, revoked retroactively, uh, quash retroactively, but then uh, cabinet may take uh, such orders or regulations as the lead on reasonable grounds are again are necessary to deal with the emergency. And these kinds of powers are specified in the act for each kinds of emergency for a public of emergency or public order emergencies. You have here the kind of things that government can regulate public assembly travel use of specified property uh, designation or securing of protected places. Um, control of public utilities uh, authorization or direction to any person to render essential services. Uh, imposition of fines um, and imprisonment up to stated limits in, in the act. Now, once we have the emergency uh, orders and me special measures have been uh, adopted, there are then no a number of um, accountability, accountability mechanisms that are uh, contemplated by the act, both parliamentary and judicial. Uh, in terms of parliamentary accountability, well, it, parliament can simply not confirm the emergency, vote against it, or terminate the declared emergency at any time by, by revoking the government's declaration. And in fact, either house can do this. Um, Parliament can also decide not to continue an emergency. So each emergency um, has specified limits to it. In the case of a public order emergency, it's 30 days. After 30 days, if the government wants it to continue, it needs to basically ask Parliament to once again uh, continue the emergency. So Parliament at this point could refrain from continuing the emergency. And uh, there is a sense in which there's a power of ongoing supervision in the act, right? So any new order, any new regulation that the government wants to make uh, needs to receive approval of uh, the Houses of Parliament or a specific committee that is um, contemplated by the act that was not um, in play, uh, so far as I know, this time around. And finally, within 60 days of an emergency, so presumably this is going to take place, we need to have uh, an inquiry to be held, um, asking what the circumstances that led to the declaration of the emergency were, uh, and, and, and discussing the measures for dealing to the with the emergency. Judicial accountability, the Act doesn't speak to it directly, but the Federal Court, of course, Act make judicial review possible. And if you look at the Act itself, there are various hooks in the Act that might make judicial review possible, which a number of um, civil, civil society organizations are trying to avail themselves of to ask for judicial review in this case, right? So administrative uh, hook for judicial review in terms of administra uh, an administrative law, but also the constitution itself, because uh, as the preamble of the act states, the, 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 the act is still subject to the constitution, both federalism and, 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 and the charter. Uh, now, in terms of uh, judicial review, uh, well, here are a number of books. Uh, Parliament has limited cabinet's powers under the act in two ways. It defines the sort of exigent circumstances in which cabinet can proclaim a national emergency. And for public order emergencies actually prescribes the matters, right? That cabinet uh, may make uh, orders in relation to. Uh, now, there might be a lot of deference that's afforded given the kind of decision that's made. Presumably you need to find that the decisions was unreasonable for there to be review. Uh, we may find out uh, in, in a few weeks whether that was indeed the case. Um, obviously, division of power, the act tracks um, basically the public power, right? So, so you need to have a rational basis for the federal government to intrude uh, on the uh, competence of provinces if it wants to do so, but needs to do so in a temporary way. Um, Again, there were a lot of deference in past cases. These cases are old now. The anti-inflation reference is many decades old uh, that were afforded by the Supreme Court to the government under this branch of, of the POG. Uh, if it's invoked again, let's see if the Supreme Court will still think the same thing. And obviously the Canadian Charter, right? So the act and measures that are adopted under it are subject to the Charter. Uh, various rights contained therein, freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, right not to be arbitrarily detained, not to have one's assets unreasonably uh, seized. Uh, but of course, all of this will need to be subjected to section one analysis um, and the limitation clause uh, of the charter. We don't really have yet jurisprudence on that count. And, and presumably government could, and it hasn't done so this time around, invoke the notwithstanding clause of section 33 of the charter to 
simply bypass the charter. How does a, na a national emergency end? Well, it ends like it can end like it just did. Uh, sorry, it should be a three here. The federal cabinet can just revoke the emergency by declaration at any time. So I hear this has just been done this afternoon. Uh, either House of Parliament can also do so. And then, as I said, emergencies have sunset periods. Uh, if they're not continued, they simply uh, sunset. But presumably, if there is continuation, emergencies can continue uh, indefinitely. There are also some provisions dealing with compensation. Individuals are immune from uh, having to pick on some compensation, but the Crown isn't. So this is basically uh, what uh, the Act contemplates, uh, and I look forward to hearing what our presenters have to say about what happened this time around, whether it should be reviewed, mm -hmm. and other possibilities for dealing, emerg with dealing with emergencies that are not um, that are not the Federal Emergencies Act, including injunction and so forth. Thank you, Francois. That's fantastic. Um, this is exactly the right way to end with how can this end. Um, our next um, a speaker will not be able to stay long with us, so I'm delighted that she's been able to give us this time. Um, Christine Van Gein is the uh, litigation director for the legal charity, the Ca Canadian Constitution Foundation. Her organization's presently challenging the federal invocation of the act, and she's also the host of the national television program, Canadian Justice. And in the chat, I will post a link to the, uh, their filings that has just occurred either yesterday or today, I've lost track. Uh, Christine, please take us away. Hi, thanks for having me. I just posted a, the, the filing. Oh, so great. if any of you okay. are interested in reading our notice of application for judicial review, uh, that is available on the website there. And to preempt everyone's questions, we are still proceeding. Uh, we know that the act is being revoked, but it's imperative that this legislation, the first time it's been invoked, get some judicial interpretation, especially because it's extremely questionable as to whether the criteria under the act was actually met. We're obviously submitting that the criteria was not met. So if uh, if you guys look at the notice of application, you'll see we're, we're making two arguments. Uh, first, that the criteria under the Emergencies Act hasn't been met. That's that criteria that Professor Tange Renaud uh, outlined in his presentation. Uh, so because the criteria is not met, the invocation is unlawful. And the second is that we, the second argument is that the orders under the declaration of the emergency are unconstitutional because they violate a number of charter protected rights in a way that can't be justified. So we're seeking a judicial review of the order declaring um, and, and, and to quash the emergency proclamation, the emergency measures, and the economic measures, as well as declaring those uh, measures to be unconstitutional and of no force and effect. So let me really briefly, because I have to go at five, um, explain our arguments. Um, as Professor Tenge Renault said, this has been declared a public order emergency, and the government has enacted measures under the declaration of emergency that, to summarize, uh, limit assembly, they direct people to assist the RCMP with, with towing vehicles, and they require banks to disclose otherwise private banking information to police. Um, the measures capture a broad range of conduct and they carry with them the threat of fine or impris imprisonment. So I'm gonna refer to them as the emergency measures and the economic measures. Um, under the criteria of the act, what we need to think about is the context in which this legislation was enacted. So it was it, it includes extraordinary powers. And when the legislation, the Emergencies Act, was drafted in the 80s, it was designed to ensure that the abuses of its predecessor, the War Measures Act, never happened again. Um, the War Measures Act was used during the Second World War to intern Japanese and Italian Canadians, and it was abused again. Uh, by, by this prime minister's father during the FLQ crisis in Quebec. So it's a really dark and troubled history that we need to remember when considering the context in which the Emergency Act was drafted and the conditions under which it can be evoked. And in order to prevent that type of abuse um, that we saw of the War Measures Act, the Emergency Act was drafted to ensure protection of parliamentary democracy, of federalism, of rights, and the overarching principle of the act is 
um, is proportionality. Every provision of the act is designed with the intent of limiting the federal cabinet's power to declare an emergency to only those situations where it's absolutely necessary and to grant cabinet those powers only so long as it needs to deal with a particular emergency and only as long as that emergency exists. So as Professor Tanguy Renault outlined, um, this is a, a public order emergency, which means that there's an emergency that arises from threats to security of Canada so serious that it's a national emergency. These are all defined terms through reference to the CSIS Act. And as um, Professor Francois said, this includes things like uh, espionage, activities designed to overthrow the government, activities related to serious ideological violence, um, and foreign influenced activities. And this is the, Canada has survived, you know, terrorist attacks, a, a pandemic without this being invoked, for it to be invoked now um, is extremely, it's extremely questionable. In our view, it doesn't meet the criteria of the act. So I have only three minutes because I really have, <laughs> I have, I have other, like a lot of obligations today, and um, including a hard deadline at five, but I'll really briefly mention our charter arguments. The main thrust of our, our judicial review is, is about failing to meet the criteria of the act, but we do make some charter arguments as well. Uh, in this case, the emergency measures violate the right to free assembly. Uh, the right to be free from unreasonable search, that's through the, the economic measures that um, compel banks to provide information to the police, otherwise private banking information, and because these, these measures come with serious terms of imprisonment, and it implicates our Section 7 right to liberty. Um, they're not minimally impairing, uh, so they're not justified infringements, and I'll give a couple of examples uh, just to, to illustrate this. On the right to assembly, we know that these measures were invoked in response to the truck protests, obviously, and to the block blockades in particular, but the prohibition is actually against assembly that may reasonably lead to a breach of the peace. And with the protests clear, going forward, it's not clear to us how the government will enforce that prohibition and what evidence or intelligence will be used to, satis be used to satisfy a reasonable belief that a breach of the peace might occur. So for example, if protests were organized in response to the government's invocation of the Emergencies Act, would it be possible for the government and police to conclude there's a reasonable expectation that a breach of the peace might occur at these protests, uh, given what's happened uh, at the previous protests? And reasoning along those lines isn't far-fetched, and this risks chilling legitimate speech and demonstrations by instilling fear in those who might otherwise want to participate in lawful demonstrations. Um, with the minute I have left, I will say that uh, on the, the financial uh, freezing of assets, Canadian citizens uh, enjoy a reasonable expectation of privacy over the information that banks hold about us, including details of the accounts that they hold and funds that they possess and the way they spend their money. And by requiring financial institutions to provide that information to CSIS or the RCMP, um, these economic measures constitute a search and we submit that they constitute a search in a way that's not compliant with Hunter and Southern, which is the governing law on this uh, from the Supreme Court. Um, that is all the time I have uh, to preempt your, your questions since I'm not gonna be available to answer them. Uh, we don't know when the hearing's gonna be yet. Uh, we know that the CCLA has also brought a challenge and we um, expect there's a high chance that our, our applications will be combined. We would be totally happy with that. Um, and no, the prime minister's invocation or, or rec rescission of the invocation doesn't change the fact that we will be proceeding with the case because in our view, it's imperative that this legislation get interpreted the first time it's used. That's all the time I have but check out the notice of application. It's it's really interesting stuff. Fantastic, a real litigator there, able to yeah. hit a remark. Uh, thank you, Christine. And we can only imagine what you're running off to with the, the recent announcement plus everything else on your on your plate. Thank you. And everybody, uh, this, what you get the link to will also go up on the webpage with all the other documents that have been already put up and will keep getting put up. Thank okay, you so much, Christine. You. Our next speaker is Eric Adams, um, 
and Eric is uh, Vice Dean and Professor of Law at University of Alberta's Faculty of Law. Uh, he writes uh, broadly in the areas of constitutional law, legal history, and human rights. Um, I'll just uh, paste in here a little bit of more information about uh, Eric in a moment, and for those of you interested. Uh, and he's going to take us through a little bit about Canada's constitutional emergencies, uh, learning from the past. Eric. Well, thanks, Craig, and uh, thanks to folks who organized on short notice, uh, and uh, thanks for those uh, tuning in. Um, I'm presenting this from Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta, at the University of Alberta. So it seems to me, if it's not already obvious, that uh, emergencies are a sad fact of democratic life. And the health of our democracy, it seems to me, is not defined by whether such periodic emergencies occur, but rather how we deal with them. And maybe most importantly, whether we have the capacity to learn from them. Um, I have to stop my phone. Sorry about that. Having drafted Canada's Constitution Act of 1867 against the backdrop of the American Civil War and being no strangers to insurrection, assassination, uh, natural disasters, and yes, pandemics at home, the framers of our Constitution uh, were well acquainted with the need for jurisdictional power to manage emergencies when they occur. But they also knew that in a diverse federation, such emergencies might be local or national in scope. And sometimes they might move from one category to the other. There was no need in their minds to designate a specific emergency power when they divided jurisdictions in sections 91 and 92, better to cover the field by providing a jurisdictional catch-all to provinces, matters of a local and private nature in 9216, and the broad powers, of course, to parliament enacted in section 91, peace, order, and good government, POG. Drawing the precise line between the local and the national, reconciling diversity and unity, that's been the challenge of Canadian constitutional law for more than 150 years. And that dividing line poses problems and challenges in economics and the environment and in emergencies uh, too. But I don't think there's ever been a constitutional doubt that both governments have a legitimate role to play in, in managing and legislating in relation to those aspects of emergencies that which fall within their respective fields. And I don't think we'd want it otherwise. But government powers that are great, such as those required to deal with emergencies, also contain the power to do great harm. And Christine uh, mentioned some of these. Uh, in 1914, as the First World War descended, Parliament enacted the War Measures Act, uh, borrowing in some ways from a similar legislative regime that had just been enacted in the United Kingdom, the Defense of the Realm Act. That act, granted the federal cabinet the power to bypass parliament and to enact orders, and here I'll quote, deemed advisable for the security, defense, peace, order, and welfare of Canada. It was just that broad. And courts, in a handful of cases that judicially reviewed the uses of these powers, agreed that, one, the War Measures Act was a constitutional exercise of the emergency branch of POG, and two, in the words of Chief Justice Fitzpatrick of the Supreme Court of Canada, that, the, that, that Parliament intended in the War Measures Act to, to clothe the executive with the widest powers in time of danger. Now, those wide powers in the First and Second World War resulted in many thousands of perfectly sensible, reasonable, and necessary orders managing the economic life of Canada and planning for Canada's participation in these world wars. But they also contained hundreds of racist policies and orders, the ones I'm most familiar with, which directly impacted the lives of 22,000 Japanese Canadians living in British Columbia. During the Second World War, under the powers of the War Measures Act, Japanese Canadians were forcibly removed from their homes, interned and incarcerated, and dispossessed of everything they owned, every home, personal possession, business, car, uh, 
precious fa family heirloom to everyday possession was seized and sold all under the guise of an emergency power. Japanese Canadians spent longer in internment outside of the war than during it. Japanese Canadians were interned from 1942 to 1949 under the guise or under the argument that emergencies and the Second World War, despite the fact that hostilities had ended, the emergency from a constitutional perspective lingered on and on and on. None of the orders which dispossessed Japanese Canadians, which sold their possessions, and indeed which came to exile them from Canada and strip them of their Canadian citizenship, which occurred in 1946, none of those orders were debated in Parliament. None of them were the subject of media scrutiny. None of them were the subject of an academic round table or academic criticism of any kind. The most criticism they received was in the Japanese Canadian community press. To this day, if you were to try and look up the orders that dispossessed Japanese Canadians of their property, you would have to go to an archive as opposed to um, a source that is publicly accessible and available. So the War Measures Act did tremendous, great, and lingering damage in the Second World War. And in the shadow of emergency, great powers and harms can wreak havoc. And in, in, in many ways, Canadian history, I think, was, was, the, was the sufferer of, uh, of, of that great havoc. But, and here's where I'll conclude, um, the Emergencies Act learns from that lesson in the architecture of the act itself. And it's important, and as uh, Francois so clearly laid out, that there are so many levers of accountability placed through that act, not only uh, both houses of parliament, um, but also individual scrutiny of the orders themselves, and ultimately the attention of, uh, of history that will be brought by parliamentary review committees and the necessary inquiry that the act requires. It's also incumbent on the legal profession to, um, to scrutinize the uses of these powers. And I welcome the constitutional challenges that have been um, uh, initiated, even though in my view, we can talk about this in round two, there are uses and needs for emergency powers and we should non nonetheless remember that emergencies do occur. And then in my view, we can talk about this, there are likely strong grounds, maybe not insurmountable uh, to some forms of challenge, but grounds that this was an emergency that uh, grounded the act. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Eric, um, not only for the, the history that had elements that uh, I wasn't aware of, the, the, the length of, uh, to 1949, for example, um, but also linking past to present with um, the current act. And in that, uh, in that vein, we're waiting uh, for a little bit of the, the history uh, thematics to play themselves out uh, before um, making sure that just ahead of the next speaker, and you'll see why, um, that we make sure to acknowledge where we've come from and where we're at. I posted um, York University's land acknowledgement, um, <clears throat> which is basically links our history to our present. Uh, York, where I am, and the city where Corey, who's coming up, uh, is recognizes many indigenous nations have long standing relationship with the territories around our campuses. Uh, York acknowledges the presence on the traditional of, on the tradi traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been taken care uh, by the Ashishnabek uh, Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat, now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current, current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the entire Great Lakes region. And with that, I wanted to uh, introduce Corey. Corey Sheffman, the litigator at Ulpius Claire Townsend uh, LLP, uh, OKT, as we all know them, 
uh, representing Indigenous peoples, persons, and organizations across Canada. And he's going to speak about the colonial legacy and systemic racism that structures uh, the rule of law or the so-called rule of law in Canada uh, as being on full display in the events of the last uh, few weeks. Um, Corey, please take us away. Thanks so much, Craig. And you, you took uh, the land acknowledgement right out of my mouth. Thank you for that. Um, there are a few really significant takeaways from the events of the last few weeks that that I want to highlight in the the context of, as you said, my uh, my knowledge and my practice as a lawyer for Indigenous peoples. Um, and Indigenous peoples experiences with protests, with the rule of law, and with public order uh, generally. And the two themes I want to really structure this around are first that the rule of law is a tool not so much a rule. Uh, and it's wielded selectively and often for partisan purposes. And when I say partisan, I don't necessarily mean political partisan, but partisan as, as in interests. Sometimes those partisan means are more widely palatable, uh, but that's rarely the case when politicians start talking about the rule of law. Second, uh, and related, the jurisdictional confusion uh, and police being slow to act with respect to these protests, the whole, oh, whatever can we do about this problem um, of it all, is whatever other causes might be attributed to it, a real mask off moment for Canadian governments and police. Uh, and I want to start by talking about Ipperwash, uh, which hopefully we all uh, know about. Uh, Ipperwash was the site of a significant uh, Indigenous protest, um, which led to the death of uh, an Indigenous, Indigenous protester, uh, Dudley George. Uh, afterwards, the OPP developed a framework for how the OPP would develop with what would, sorry, how they would deal with what they call Aboriginal critical incidents. Uh, and for them, Aboriginal critical incidents can be anything from a passive demonstration to uh, a protest where uh, the public is significantly affected. One example they give is the blockage of a transportation route. The, I think, mar most um, remarkable thing about this framework is that it emphasizes negotiation and de-escalation. Um, you can argue, and we've heard arguments from police and municipal officials the last few weeks, that those are the sort of things that the Ottawa police were trying with respect to the, the protest. But there's two important points here. First is that this protest was different, both in terms of breadth and depth from most Indigenous protests in Canada. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And second is that one of the key components of the OPP's framework for Indigenous protests, which is transparency, transparency with the public and transparency with the protesters, seems to have been missing here. Um, I know uh, Kent Roach, who's on this panel or this roundtable, wrote an article recently about uh, fragmentation in policing, which I uh, highly recommend uh, and I think uh, speaks to some of this as well. And it's worth recognizing that policing protests in Ontario looks different than it used to, and it looks different than it does elsewhere. For example, we've all seen or hopefully have seen uh, the, how the RCMP in British Columbia have responded to Indigenous pipeline protests over the last few years with heavily militarized force and crackdowns so brutal that a British Columbia Supreme Court judge set aside an injunction out of concern that the intensity of police enforcement action would bring the administration of justice into dis disrepute. The Court of Appeal uh, la later overturned uh, the setting aside of that injunction, but the fact is that the judge was concerned enough to make that significant uh, change. That looks very different from some of the recent protests here, including uh, blockades of rail lines. Even in those cases where enforcement is more measured, largely economic protests are still met with injunctions that are sought or supported by the Crown and are followed up by enforcement. But at the protesters' choices are relevant. Indigenous protests tend to be more targeted. Traditional territory that's slated for development, for example. Even when infrastructure like rail lines are targeted, the harm, if any, is most often economic. 
During the Idle No More protests in 2015-ish, when protesters occupied INAC offices across Canada, like really occupied them, took them over, the response was fairly restrained, and the workers in those offices just worked from home for a while. The protesters in Ottawa were causing real and direct human health impacts, or that's the argument, to uninvolved bystanders. That isn't what we see most often from Indigenous protests. When police encounter Indigenous protesters, though, there's rarely any doubt about what happens next, and this has been true since Louis Riel. Injunctions are commonplace and police enforcement is expected. Here, police didn't seem to know what to do with themselves. Were they supposed to stop supplies or let them in? Enforce noise bylaws or not? Craig, if you can uh, put up the uh, image that I sent you. This also goes deeper than just how protests are policed. The idea that some of those protesters had kids in the trucks and children's aid and the police just did nothing about it is frankly wild. Uh, indigenous children get apprehended from their families if they wear the wrong clothes to school. And you're telling me that there were kids in those trucks being used as human shields and police just sort of sat there? Uh, the image on your screen is from Kent Monkman, a Cree artist from Manitoba. Uh, it's called The Scream. A uh, link to uh, Kent's uh, website is in the chat. Um, and the reason I wanted to put it up on the screen is for many Indigenous people today, um, this is very, in a very real sense, the uh, experience uh, with policing. Uh, there's a deeply colonial element to policing in Canada. Remember that it was the RCMP who forced Indigenous children into residential schools, who took Indigenous children from their families during the 60s scoop and continue to do so at alarming rates today. And of course, it was the predecessors to the RCMP who were sent in as a militia force when Louis Riel created Manitoba's first government. So when news reported that police were not only not stopping, but often assisting these protesters, the response from many Indigenous people was a collective, yeah, what did you expect? Uh, the, the experience of Indigenous protesters and Indigenous peoples just being Indigenous um, is very different from uh, the experience that the largely uh, settler protest uh, experienced over the last few days. Uh, and it will be interesting to see going forward how the imposition of the Emergencies Act in this circumstance uh, may play a role uh, in future Indigenous protests. Uh, the last thing that I'll, I'll mention is that um, one interesting gloss uh, on these protests is that after the last round of Indigenous, significant Indigenous protests um, around the uh, BC pipe, one of the BC pipelines, a number of provincial governments passed uh, critical infrastructure protection acts or things with those uh, sorts of names intended really to stop Indigenous people from protesting on economic infrastructure. Uh, we talked about these, or we heard in the media some of these things being talked about in respect of the uh, recent protests, but to my knowledge, um, other than one arrest in Alberta, I'm not sure whether, I, I certainly haven't heard about them being applied. Um, and so it's interesting, uh, Professor Tenge Renault mentioned no other statute being applicable as being a prerequisite for the Emergencies Act, it's interesting uh, that those have were not do not appear to have been used. Thank you ever so much, Corey. Um, for the not just historical, but uh, present day uh, contextualizing of how we think about uh, law and emergency. Um, uh, thank you. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Jen King, who's an environmental law partner, partner at Gowings. Um, she practices administrative and public law, appearing before all levels of courts and uh, tribunals with a recent focus on emergencies and climate change. Uh, at Gowings, she has, she's part of a team representing the city of Windsor in its injunction to restrain illegal blockades on the US-Canada Ambassador Bridge. Um, and as Craig, well, Craig, Jen tells me that the host is preventing her from uh, turning on her camera or it is, is on mute. There's All a right. technical issue here. 
I think I see your name listed in the general participants list and not in the co-host list. So I wonder if it's a, the right link. Yeah, I, in, I can oh, now good. turn on my, <laughs> I think ah, my video, yeah, no, good. my Excellent. video is still stopped, but you can hear me. Uh, okay, well, we might be able to fix that. Um, All right. But I'll just, just finish with, and, and Jen will be able to also link uh, the, uh, what she's been doing in Windsor with her team to an injunction that was also just uh, secured in the city of Ottawa. So she's going to speak to us about uh, the city of Windsor statutory injunction restraining those individuals from impeding the ambassador bridge. There we are. Yay. My God. Hi. Just in time across the border uh, service. Thank uh, you, Jen. Professor Scott. Hi. So my, uh, I'm going to speak just for a few minutes about uh, the City of Windsor's injunction, which it obtained on February the 11th and continued last Friday. Um, it's unusual because in this case, I can speak to you both about the orders and decisions and the reasons which were released uh, within days after uh, the Chief Justice's decisions on the injunctions. Um, so I thought I would start with just a quick timeline so that you can place it in the context of the emergency declarations. Um, um, talk to you a little bit about the legal basis of a municipal statutory injunction under the Municipal Act and, um, and tell you a little bit about the City of Windsor's argument and the Chief Justice's decisions. So uh, to put this in context, the blockade of the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, uh, so Amb the Ambassador Bridge, I think everyone is now aware, if you weren't before, uh, that the Ambassador Bridge is a border uh, between the US and Canada, and uh, the entrance to the Ambassador Bridge is in Windsor, in the city, and frankly, in a, in a residential area. And on February the 7th, uh, there was a blockade of the bridge, which to different extents impeded almost entirely uh, traffic going onto the bridge to the US. Um, that happened on Monday, February the 7th. Uh, by Thursday, we were in court before the Chief Justice and the city of Windsor uh, brought a motion to intervene as a party. The plaintiff in that case was the Automotive Parts uh, Manufacturers Association. And they brought a, um, a motion for an injunction, uh, both on an equitable relief and under uh, Section 440 of the Municipal Act. Um, that was put over uh, for a day to give some notice to the respondents who are essentially unknown peoples. And on Friday the 11th, there was argument for half a day and the Chief Justice granted the injunction under both equitable relief and uh, the statutory relief under the Municipal Act. Um, the order was effective at seven o'clock that evening. Uh, over the weekend, the number of, uh, thank you. So this is, the, this is the statutory test. And essentially uh, a municipality or a taxpayer can seek an, in, an injunction to uh, restrain action breaching municipal bylaws. I'll speak a little bit more about the test here uh, in a few minutes, but uh, what actually happened was that the number of protesters increased after notice of the order uh, got out uh, to about six or 800 people on Saturday night. But by the end of the weekend, the police uh, enforcement actions cleared the bridge. And by Monday morning, uh, traffic was proceeding onto the bridge. Um, over that week, last week, uh, we also uh, brought a motion to continue the injunction last Friday. And so, so just if you look at the timeline, the, the declaration of an emergency wasn't until February the 14th. And so by that time, we had uh, the Chief Justice reasons and the bridge was clear. Um, by that Friday, uh, so last Friday, we argued a motion to continue the injunction. And uh, the city of Windsor uh, basically switched places with the plaintiff and proceeded with the injunction purely as a statutory uh, injunction. And you'll see in a minute why. Um, and uh, he granted the continuation of that injunction on a permanent basis, essentially, which you can do more easily under Section 440 of the Municipal Act, uh, and released the reasons yesterday. So we have two sets of reasons from Chief Justice Morowitz, um, which I think are an excellent read. I think, uh, Professor Scott, you have them up on the website. Um, so what's the legal basis? So on the first, the first day, on February the 11th, uh, we argued both the equitable relief under RJR McDonald and the statutory relief. And the Chief Justice in his first decision talked about the differences between those types of relief. Um, under the RJR McDonald test, there's additional tests essentially that you have to meet. And I'll just to put it briefly, because I don't have a lot of time, under the statutory injunction, you just have to prove a prima facie breach of municipal bylaws. And 
these are presumptively valid laws. Uh, the Chief Justice was very clear that when you have presumptively valid laws, you have to follow them. And uh, he had, I think there was ample evidence he found before him showing that there was a breach of those laws. And in fact, uh, the breach of the order and of the bylaws continued after notice of the first injunction issued and police presence remained in the area to ensure that the bridge remained clear. Uh, the, so the legal basis is really quite simple. It's what you posted, Professor Scott. Um, uh, and I don't think it's too necessary to go much further. The continuation of it, he considered whether or not there was a continuing risk. But I, I will point out that in Ottawa, uh, the city of Ottawa brought an injunction uh, that was heard before the uh, Associate Chief Justice last Monday. And the Associate Chief Justice granted the injunction that was sought by Ottawa and um, to enforce its bylaws and did so on a permanent basis as well. So um, I don't even know if I, where I am on time, so I can speak a little bit more about the Good, argument. You've got a minute and a half. Then oh, look at me. <laughs> um, I have some time. So, I, you know, I think that there's what's what's interesting about the city of Windsor bringing and continuing this injunction is that it has the availability of the Municipal Act and the Section 440 uh, tests under the Municipal Act. Um, I just wanted to note a couple of, I think, really important and powerful points from the Chief Justice reasons which were uh, released yesterday. At paragraph 59, the Chief Justice uh, confirmed that court orders are not recommendations or suggested suggestions to be followed at the discretion of those to whom it applies. The rule of law requires that everyone obey the law. Um, he also didn't accept any of the submissions that there were other ways to enforce or to ensure that the bridge remained clear. The test for a statutory injunction doesn't, doesn't require the availability of other um, consideration of, of the availability of other enforcement remedies. Um, he also noted in both decisions, um, and I'll note in paragraph 68 of his reasons from yesterday, he repeated what he said in his reasons from February the 14th. Uh, simply put, freedom of expression does not extend to the point that the protesters' activities can result in the denial of fundamental rights and freedoms to all those who detriment to all those detrimentally affected by the blockade. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, just gonna cancel that buzzer. Uh, our next um, speaker and guest is Monique Gillison, who's a partner at Lensner, Lensner Slate, a seasoned litigator whose clients turn to for uh, very tough commercial disputes. She's a fearless trial lawyer by reputation and performance, outstanding strategist, and an expert in obtaining and responding to injunctions. Now, if that doesn't sound like a Lensner Slate lawyer, I don't know what does. And uh, Monique is going to speak about the Mareva injunction that she was uh, running uh, uh, out of Ottawa uh, and the Emergencies Act, a comparative view. Thank you. Uh, it was a great segue from uh, Jen into this one because, of course, it's not a statutory uh, injunction. It's a, an injunction you can, uh, that you know, dates back now many years um, as a civil remedy. <clears throat> so let me just give you a bit of background. Um, I'm sure you have all heard about the class action brought by uh, Ms. Lee as a representative plaintiff and the Champ and Associates firm brought against a number of defendants involved in the Freedom Convoy. The basic part of the claim um, is that it was the common intention of the organizer defendants and the trucker defendants to interfere with and disturb the downtown Ottawa residences and businesses with their occupation. Um, in order to compel the government of Canada to meet their demands to drop public health measures. So the causes of action under that claim were public nuisance and private nuisance. Private nuisance is the, is the honking, the noise, and the public nuisance. The losses is really a large collection of private nuisances from individuals um, uh, uh, against individuals who suffered special damage. So the blocks, sidewalks and roads, roadways, diesel fumes from idling vehicles, those things. Um, together with the noise, um, it's alleged caused the public nuisance. So Paul Champ and his colleagues brought uh, the noise injunction against the honking uh, before the city did, and uh, that order was granted and extended. Um, along the way, we were retained to consider and bring a Mareva injunction uh, against certain defendants. So Mareva injunction is a powerful tool that we see 
in civil litigation often. Um, it's an extraordinary remedy, but it is, uh, it is a tool you do see used fairly often. It's granted pretrial to restrain a party um, from removing assets from the jurisdiction or dissipating those assets in order to avoid judgment. So that's the test at a high level. You have to have a strong prima facie case. And, and of course you have to show as in all injunctions that there's irreparable harm. And in the context of a Mareva, the irreparable harm is typically done by showing that there are gonna be assets that are gonna be dissipated. Um, so before Senior Regional Justice McLeod, we uh, established both parts of that test. Um, the strong prima facie case, we relied on the evidence of uh, two of the representative plaintiffs, but also public statements of others. And of course, the various declarations of emergency, uh, including the Federal Emergencies Act, um, and not just those um, declarations, but the other orders made, including the, the uh, uh, the noise injunction and the one um, Jen just talked about from um, the city. And then we also had to establish that there was a risk of dissipation of the assets and the evidence was strong that the organizers had moved from their traditional crowdfunding websites to cryptocurrency because as in the words of one of the respondents, um, and this is a quote, Bitcoin really has become the only method of distributing funds and it can't be stopped. So the belief of um, the respondents, as reflected in their public statements, we allege, um, was that moving their fundraising into cryptocurrency would really avoid the long arm of the court. And so one of the issues that was uh, that Justice McLeod um, ad addressed in our uh, hearing, and of course, this was a, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, it was an ex parte without notice hearing because there is a risk of dissipation of assets, you do bring it um, without notice. And, and we did do that. And we're back in court um, on Monday next week um, as we must be to uh, seek to extend the order. And so one of the questions uh, his honor had was how or whether the proposed Marave injunction overlapped with the Emergencies Act. Um, I think given that um, it's now been revoked, it demonstrates that it was um, that, they, that they do not overlap. Um, uh, but the, the main issue, um, uh, or there's lots of issues here, but of course, one of the issues is that um, the Marave injunction freezes the assets of uh, particular respondents, um, and uh, it does so in order to avoid the dissipation of those assets, which ought to be uh, remain in place for the judgment. The economic measures order, um, the RCM RCMP described the purpose of the emergency economic measures as to strongly encourage individuals to leave the illegal protest, so to stop the behavior. So there's a very significant difference between the Mareva injunction, which is to secure those assets for a judgment, and the emergency uh, measures, which is to um, impact the, the behavior. So two very different uh, purposes. And I'm at five minutes, so I will talk more about the um, uh, about the reasons of Justice McLeod in the next round. Thank you so much, uh, Monique. Um, and indeed, whoops, there we are. Um, I guess that's the equivalent of the red light in, in court. Um, our next speaker is Kent Roach, uh, who's professor of law at U of T, written frequently. I'm supposed to say on national security matters only. Well, you've written frequently on like many, many things. Um, one of the Canada's leading law scholars and is the author of Canadian Policing, Why and How It Should Change, which is going to be published shortly by Irwin Law. And I'll also post for everybody the article already referenced by Corey that uh, really is a good read to give even more, put more bones on what uh, uh, flesh on the bones of what Ken is about to say. Ken. Well, thank, thank you very much, Craig, and, and, and thanks for, for everyone who's attending and uh, organizing uh, this very interesting uh, event. I have to say, and this is maybe something we can get into the second round and Corey can talk to, um, 
although um, you know the 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 injunctions are, are obviously uh, obtained from skilled uh, litigators uh, and responded to what I'll describe later as a policing failure, I can't help but think that. Um, that kind of, you know, law and order, you must obey the injunction, how often that is used against Indigenous uh, protesters and perhaps environmental protesters. And so, you know, and, and, and I'd be interested in Craig's views also on the NDP support, because I, I, I really do worry that um, uh, some of the implications of how this has played out is going to rebound uh, on ways that I think many people who have expressed support uh, for the injunctions and class actions and uh, and uh, even the invocation of the Emergency Act. Um, anyway, so I, I just kind of put that as a matter of provocation. Uh, basically, um, I just want to want to say is 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 that. Uh, what we see here is part of an intelligence failure uh, to the extent uh, that there is kind of far right violence and in my just security piece, I try to lay it out. Uh, I think uh, 25 deaths at least attributed in Canada to far right violent extremism uh, since 2014. Uh, and so even if there was intelligence produced in kind of central Ottawa, uh, it didn't seem to get its way down uh, to the Ottawa police. Uh, second, the Ottawa police uh, and, you know, the, the, the police board uh, is a bit of an S show uh, and had no policies on how to police Wellington Street, which just astounded me and reminded me of what Justice Morden said about the Toronto Police Service Board in the wake of the G20. Uh, so even if there was uh, intelligence, uh, it didn't uh, get to the people uh, uh, who should have had that. Uh, I also think that we need to reevaluate uh, whether uh, the Ottawa police uh, should police uh, Wellington Street and the parliamentary pre uh, uh, precinct, which is not to say that the RCMP is not with uh, uh, without its problems. I also agree with Senator Vern White that we should probably close down that street uh, and have it just for pedestrians and protesters uh, 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 of all stripes uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, the injunctions is, I think, um, you know, as a criminal law scholar, uh, I see this as a way to, you know, kind of make up uh, for the lack of a modern uh, criminal code provisions to deal with protests. So basically, we still have reading the Riot Act, uh, sedition, unlawful drilling that's been around in the code since 1892. The irony is the government passed legislation on harassment of healthcare workers and healthcare sites, but it, it was a typical kind of piecemeal uh, 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 provision uh, that uh, really did uh, did uh, no, no good. So, you know, just to finish, uh, I see this as intelligence failures, uh, policing failures, uh, criminal code failures, and I'm a little bit leery about government by injunction, the presumption in an injunction proceeding, especially Indigenous people don't even have standing to raise their rights, a presumption that everything is consistent with the Charter. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit shy about uh, uh, endorsing uh, 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 dealing with this through injunctions. Thank you so much, Kent. Um, I may take you up on, on the challenge, depending on how much time is left. Although everybody should know, nobody consulted me <laughs> on the Hill. Um, so uh, that, that, that is no excuse for me dodging. I'll try not to dodge a bit later. Um, so our, our next uh, guest is uh, Brendan uh, Van Nienhuis. And Brendan is an admin and civil litigator, partner at Stockwoods, who teaches admin uh, at Osgood. 
I've litigated prominent protests and policing um, encounters and social media cases, spoken on disinformation and the urgent ethical response demanded of the law and the legal profession. Uh, he's going to speak to us about an in, in, interconnecting set of ideas around information market failure, the rule of law, uh, and the rights and fantasies of protests and protesters. I'll, I'll, I'll try anyways. Thanks, Craig. Um, um, the way I kind of look at this is that if there is an, if this is an emergency, then we had better get used to a constant or rolling state of emergencies uh, for the foreseeable future. Because the real um, emergency, as I see it, is the fact that disinformation has taken so firmly a, a root in such a substantial percentage of our population in a way that the Emergencies Act is fundamentally incapable of responding to or dealing with as is most other legislation that's on the books or imaginable. Uh, there is um, the element of the sort of far-right extremism that Kent um, made a reference to that that's, um, that's at the hard core, so to speak, of uh, some of these events, but I think it's underappreciated perhaps the degree to which the larger coterie of protesters in these cases appears to hold a wide range of ludicrous and often conflicting um, beliefs in disinformation uh, that, um, that, that's evident. And you can see this in some of the arrest footage and so forth, the, the, the genuine disbelief in the eyes of those being arrested that, that what is happening is actually happening to them. If the number one slogan on the streets of Ottawa was, happened to have the bad luck to be there at the first week of this um, event um, was uh, F. Trudeau, uh, the close second, and I think the dominant and unifying, the true unifying belief amongst those present appears to be that the media are the virus and that the best resources of information are available from Zello channels, Parler, and uh, Telegram, and for those more mainstream, Facebook. 10% um, of the population, five, say 5% or 10% of the population actually believes this range of disinformation and is prepared to act in this fashion on it. Ultimately, that cannot be stopped. Five or 10% of the population willing to act on their beliefs is enough to upend and rewrite a national social consensus as you know, a very different example. You can look to what was accomplished by Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, John Lewis, and others that lasted for decades, although it may be coming to an end in terms of its effect on the American social consensus. Uh, um, I've spoken on this before, and, I, and, and I'll give sort of an abbreviated version of some of those thoughts, but in a lot of ways, the disinformation marketplace uh, gets inside what we call the OODA loop, the observe, orient, um, decide, and act loop of decision makers uh, in, the, you know, in the market of politics and in the market of state power. Um, the Emergencies Act does not offer a viable uh, solution to that particular set of problems. Um, uh, one thing I find really telling is the degree to which the participants framing of the situation um, actually involves some degree of faith, particularly in judicial processes and judicial systems. It's part of the internal narrative of some of these conspiracy theories uh, that, um, that uh, you know, oddly, in a way, engendered some compliance with the original injunction granted in Ottawa with respect to stopping a honk. There's a recognition uh, and, and a lot of the content of the disinformation is flavored with what you might call bad legal takes um, from the sort of level of the Freeman on the land ludicrousy to uh, you know, claims such as a waving a white flag required the police not to arrest you by virtue of international law, which is a claim being uh, promulgated by um, uh, um, Pat King, who's currently um, has his bail on reserve. Uh, and, and the language of rights, including complaints about the failure to respect, quote, First Amendment protections that you've seen in a lot of these cases, quite extraordinary, but it does reflect a residual and useful respect for the rule of law as perhaps one of the only methods left of combating um, what, what I see to be the sort of true cause of the uh, uh, emergency as it's developed in fact. Uh, and in that sense, the bail hearings that are ongoing now in the city of Ottawa in particular, but also elsewhere. And the other direct confrontations with the judicial truth-finding and fact-finding process in our system in an orderly, patient, and methodical process is the one remaining form of state or institutional power that's actually capable of restoring 
albeit in a painfully slow and methodical fashion, some degree of trust in a state-driven truth establishment process of the exertion of state power that, in, in my view, is much more important than the, than the use of the emergencies uh, 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 act in and of itself. Uh, the stability of public order is essentially critically dependent on the end of the road processes of a first instance court with whom someone believing this information slams face first into the ground to deal with and offers an opportunity to do something both in uh, our position as legal um, you know, academics, but also practitioners and, uh, and most importantly from the, from, the, from the position of the bench. Um, judicial encounters in this scenario need to be extremely focused on the communication to the losing party and those who share the belief set or the belief scheme of the losing party, including the fundamental reasons for their distrust in other you know, broad sources of information in preference to their own um, you know, sources of disinformation. Uh, doing everything possible, not just to correctly and dispassionately decide on the evidence, but to enable the, the individual defendants and accused in these scenarios and those who are watching them and reading their reasons and evaluating what's happening in their bail hearings is essential to allow them to or force eventually some of them to distinguish between reality and fantasy and not integrate the legal process and their beliefs about what the law says into the black hole of their disinformation scheme. Um, those encounters need to be a way to disrupt the spread of disinformation and allow that to sort of be a, 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 a counter meme, so to speak, that spreads back through these communities um, you know, through an orderly fact-finding process that speaks to their beliefs, even if their beliefs are, uh, you know, are, 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 are incredible. Um, I have a much longer series of slides in which I sort of go, go into some of these things. I'll leave them be um, in the interest, I think, that my five of my, recognizing my five minutes has elapsed, but. Um, Brendan, we, we do have, we will have time. This is actually sets things up wonderfully for, uh, I'm just going to double check uh, because she's just joined us and maybe wasn't expecting to come on this early. Um, Diane, uh, would you be uh, interested in going next? Um, yes, yeah, sure. I am I'm okay. fine with that. And, and uh, I have to say, this is our first time meeting. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, is it Diane or Diane? Uh, it's Diane, but I'm, I'm used to both, so that's quite fine. Okay, so Diane Maga or Diane Magas? Um, um, or, or uh, is, Adrian, is, I guess um, it's actually Ukrainian, so maybe it's not, ah, not the but, right time uh, in this. In, uh, in, indeed, my goodness, I didn't. I was going to start out by saying there are emergencies, and then there are emergencies um, yes. today. But uh, yeah, um, uh, so Yen is a, a criminal defense lawyer practicing in Ottawa for for almost thirty years. Uh, bear, and um, has been representing a number of the folks arrested. And she's going to talk to us about the right to reasonable bail, bail during a state of emergency from her uh, perspective right on the ground. Dion, thank you for joining us. And, and may, she may not be able to stay because you'll all understand uh, she's kind of um, in the mat. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the, the middle of preparing a bail review application for. Uh, Miss Leach, so it's, um, and I guess you uh, will have the scoop that the bail review is set to proceed on Wednesday uh, next. So uh, I think you're the first to know, <laughs> so for the group. Um, so I've been uh, practicing for 28 years and I've done in my times, a lot of bail hearings and um, I've done a lot of bail hearings for all sorts of, um, types of offenses. Over the years, I have, uh, I have been shocked. I can say that I, of what I've seen is the right to a reasonable bail under the circumstances of these emergency acts, um, which to me, um, and I can obviously speak to part of the cases that I've been involved with because of uh, part of them were public. I cannot speak to things that are private or confidential, but so I've represented uh, Chris Barber and uh, Tamara Leach on their respective bail hearing, who 
are uh, alleged to be organizers or leaders of the truckers convoy. And what I've noted is the, um, the use of the tertiary ground uh, in these bail hearings, which I would never think would be used on a mischief charge. The main charge of these two um, individuals are counseling to commit mischief and counseling to obstruct um, uh, police or public or counseling to uh, uh, break a court order, which when you're looking at them in terms of gravity of the offense, it's not the most uh, serious offense in the criminal code, but it is viewed by the courts and in the decisions that are coming down in Ottawa uh, from judges and justice of the peace and for the students um, that may not know the difference. So justices of the peace um, sit at bail hearings usually in Ontario. Although in other provinces, uh, I practice also in Quebec, and in Quebec, uh, it's judges of the provincial court that do bail hearing. But in Ottawa, and I think most uh, cities in, in uh, Ontario, there are justices of the peace. Um, sometimes in Ottawa, when we're too, uh, when there's too many bail hearing going on, then they'll ask for a judge to sit at a bail hearing, a judge of the provincial court or OCG, Ontario Court of Justice. And so in my case, it was an actual judge that did um, sit at the bail hearing of Mr. Barber and of Ms. Leach. It was actually the same judge. And she, um, Justice um, Bourgeois was the judge sitting at both. And I'm not going to give my opinion of her decision because the Decision with respect to Ms. Barber is on under bail review, and I'll have to keep my comments of uh, what I perceive to be errors that she made for that purpose, um, so as to not uh, go through that in uh, either through the media or other venue. I believe that would be improper on my part, and that's, to leave that's that. We understood, Diane. So yes, uh, truly, but I can advise that. Um, what I've seen is that the secondary ground been used in a way that I've rarely seen in the past, other than if it's for a murder, for example, or very violent offense or very serious uh, criminal offense, um, where both accused here, Mr. Barber and Ms. Leach, neither of them have a criminal record, but yet on one, um, the judge found that there were grounds on secondary uh, secondary ground to detain Ms. Barber when she has no criminal record, which is almost unseen um, in courts, like on a day-to-day -day basis when we deal with this. Um, theor theoretically, it may be different, but in practice, we deal with this every day. Someone who has no record usually is released. And as the court and in, in Supreme Court and Zora said, you know, through the latter principle. So it should be released on uh, on undertaking at uh, very least or a recognizance without surety. But here they're up to, up to the um, test in my view, much higher because of the state of emergency and because of what was perceived to be a serious impact on the population of Ottawa. And the same with the tertiary ground. Um, and the Supreme Court of Canada said that on the tertiary ground, uh, we have to look at it on the view of uh, a person that is thoughtful and that is not prone to emotional reactions um, and their, with the true knowledge of the circumstances of the case. And it appears to be that the emotion of the public has been um, heard throughout these bail hearings and the objectivity of the offenses before the courts have been lacking because of the emotions of the population of Ottawa. I think I've been talking for <laughs> six minutes and I was, um, don't know if I have to stop now because I, I'm a lawyer and I talk forever unless you tell me to stop. <laughs> so um, Dan, I'm trying have, to- Do you have just one, one more minute to, uh, when you're referring to the tertiary ground, um, what exactly are you referring to for those of us not uh, in on the ground on criminal procedure? Yeah, so tertiary ground is, is a ground of detention that is 
more focused on the public's perception of the administration of justice. So if, uh, for example, you can have, uh, it used to be that the tertiary ground was used only in very serious cases. The courts, the Supreme Court has then said it doesn't have to be limited to serious or heinous crimes, but it is based on four factors that together looks at the gravity of the offense. Uh, if a firearm was involved, uh, the uh, seriousness of the offense, the strength of the Crown's case, and things of that sort. And that if a person were to be released um, with the public's perception of the administration of justice be uh, reduced because of that release. And you could see that, for example, if someone, uh, and there was a, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but there was a doctor, the Turcot case in Quebec, um, who was, um, he was a doctor, so he had no criminal record. He was accused of killing his two children um, in the middle of a domestic um, separation and so on. So he did not fit the primary ground, which is the flight risk or the secondary ground because he had no criminal record and had roots in the community. And um, he, uh, so he would not have been detained on the first or second uh, ground. So the tertiary ground would have well, uh, suggested that he should have been detained on that ground because the public uh, would have lost confidence in the administration of justice. If someone who has no criminal record but is accused of killing his children, uh, young children, uh, would be released on bail. So that is usually what we see in court where it is used. It doesn't have to be that uh, serious of a crime but it, it is usually used for those uh, type of offenses or serious uh, drug trafficking, kilos of cocaine, uh, possession of a firearm with ammunition, like those type of serious type of cases is uh, what we see where in usual cases, uh, the tertiary ground is used. It's been used now in Ottawa with respect to those offenses that are, uh, in my professional opinion, less serious on the gravity scale of um, the criminal code, uh, but are being used, again, in my opinion, because of the high emotions involving these protests and the enactment of the emergency acts and, and the um, uh, division, I think, in the population with respect to all of that protest in Ottawa. So if that uh, answers the question with respect to um, the tertiary okay. ground. Thank you so much for making the time to pop in between um, all kinds of tasks. Yes. Uh, we, we really do appreciate it. And it's given us some insight because I would have said that on paper, the charges were regular charges, et cetera, et cetera, that somehow or other this is all, all being done without the emergency act affecting it. But that doesn't seem to be the case. That's great. It seems to be in practice. It's it's been at the forefront of the decisions that we have, and it's been a, a mischief charge. In in my experience, should have taken thirty minutes in bail court um, without a surety being required. Uh, Mr. Barber's uh, uh, bail hearing took four hours. Miss Leach's uh, four uh, bail hearing took took seven hours. That's unheard of for these type of offenses. And, and a large part was the Crown laying down all of the impacts of the protests on the population of Ottawa and, and making arguments for over an hour on those impacts to the court and the seriousness of uh, these impact. And, and that is unheard of for sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and don't feel you have to have to stay. Um, thank well, you. I'm, unfortunately, I, I will have to go. I do have... Um, to get back on, on preparing the bail review as we're going to have to argue it next week. And um, okay. Okay. all best, then. thank you. Thank you very much. Great, so our next, uh, our next speaker, we'll see if he's still on the road. Bruce, are you still on the road? My colleague, Bruce Ryder, who's been with at Osgood for the better part of 25 years a leading scholar in a whole range of constitutional law areas, freedom of expression, division of powers. Um, currently working on a book on book censorship in Canada. And uh, he told me that uh, the summary is an unfortunate invo invo invocation of the act, but unlikely to be successful 
adequately judicially reviewed. That's a really butchered sentence. So you can you can say five minutes more coherently than that, Bruce. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Craig. Can you hear me? Ah, yeah, we can. I can. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks, Craig, for bringing us all together today. Thanks to uh, Francois and Liel and the Matheson Center for uh, organizing this important conversation. It's great to join it for, for a few minutes. Um, I'd like to offer a few comments on the extent to which the federal government's resort to emergency powers is likely to be constrained by the courts. Obviously, an important question regarding the legality of the impacts that this resort to emergency powers is having on people, but also an important question for, for potential resort to emergency powers by the federal government in similar contexts in the future. Uh, and resort to emergency powers by the federal parliament, the federal government, has serious impacts on federalism and on civil liberties. And if the exercise of these powers is upheld by the courts, uh, it raises serious concerns for me uh, about potential similar impacts in the future of relying on this precedent. So most of the legal issues that are going to be raised in court challenging the federal government's action uh, are going to fall into three categories. One is, was parliament entitled to rely on the emergency branch of the peace order and good government power in these circumstances? That's a constitutional question involving the interpretation of the division of legislative powers in the Constitution Act 1867. And if so, a second group of questions uh, relate to the Emergencies Act. Was the Emergencies Act properly invoked in these circumstances? And that's a question of statutory interpretation. That is whether the requirements and procedures set out in the act were complied with. And third, if the answer to those questions is yes, uh, given that the emergency orders issued pursuant to the act by the federal government place serious restrictions on civil liberties, fundamental freedoms in the charter uh, as, and other rights in the charter. Given that that's the case, there will be important issues about whether those restrictions on fundamental freedoms and other charter rights amount to reasonable limits that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. And again, that's a constitutional question that will involve uh, the application of the section one test, the various stages of the, the Oaks test that we're all familiar with. The first set of, of questions, let me say a few words about those questions relating to the emergency branch of POD. As Eric Adams described earlier, there's a, a, a interesting history and a very concerning history regarding Parliament's resort to the emergency branch of POG over the years, during and following the two world wars, at the time, of course, at the, of the apprehended insurrection uh, in the October crisis of 1970, the extended period of double digit inflation in the 1970s. These were all occasions on which Parliament resorted to the emergency branch of POG and attempted challenges or to challenge the legality of that resort to the emergency power all failed in the courts. This time around, we have a different kind of emergency. The recent protests and blockades have had serious impacts on public order, on freedom of movement, on transportation, on the economy, quite different than the circumstances that have led Parliament to rely on the emergency branch of POG in the past. And I think it's just important for us to pause for a moment and recognize what are the consequences of relying on the emergency branch of the peace order and good government power. And what it means is that parliament or cabinet by anticipatory delegation from parliament through the framework of the Emergencies Act can make temporary laws on any matters it considers necessary to address the crisis including matters that ordinarily fall within provincial jurisdiction. So Justice Betts in the anti-inflation reference said, invoking the emergency power essentially amounts to a temporary suspension 
of the limits on Parliament's lawmaking and pow powers imposed by the division of powers in sections 91 and 92 of the 1867 Constitution Act. That is, when Parliament decides an emergency exists, the principle of federalism is temporarily suspended. Provinces cease to have any exclusive lawmaking powers. And that's obviously a serious matter in a, in a constitutional democracy that treats federalism as a fundamental principle. So can Parliament's reliance on the emergency branch of POG be challenged in court? Yes, and it has been on numerous occasions, but the burden on challengers is very high. The jurisprudence says that they have to demonstrate that Parliament lacked a rational basis for finding that a crisis exists. This is a very high bar and maybe even an impossible burden to meet. Consider the results in the anti-inflation reference itself. Seven members of the Supreme Court of Canada found that persistent double digit inflation qualified as an emergency, even though most economists disagree. They thought the situation was serious, but it wasn't an emergency. But the majority said parliament was entitled to disagree with most experts. It had a rational basis for concluding that the situation was a crisis. Similarly, one could argue very persuasively, I think, that the protests and blockades created a serious situation. They caused great inconvenience, serious harms to others, but they fell short of being a true emergency. But I think challengers are unlikely to succeed in convincing a court that they've met their burden of demonstrating on a balance of probabilities the parliament lacked a rational basis for concluding the crisis conditions existed. Craig, I imagine I'm reaching the end of my five minutes. Uh, just, if, just now, Bruce, um, are you able to stay on the road to come back in and- uh, Oh yeah, I'll stay with you. Okay, because this sets us up really well, um, including because it starts edging into, uh, although it may not have been your direct point, uh, questions of, of, of evidence. And um, that seems to be underlying a lot of this. What, who knows what and what, how much does parliament know versus the government, et cetera, about the things that they're uh, invoking as being most concerned about. Uh, the foreign interference side, um, how much uh, proof was there, is there, but who has access to it? And I allege its accountability might uh, emerge from the inquiry. We should all keep in mind that the Emergencies Act provisions on the inquiry are uh, are very are threadbare. They don't they don't set out any real uh, parameters except for two general kinds of things that can be looked into. Sounds to me like it gets kicked over to the Inquiries Act, over which the government has a lot of control. So it'll be interesting to see um, what is exactly meant by that. We're going to end our first round, and then we're going to have something resembling sort of uh, uh, a speed round to carry us up to seven o'clock after. We're going to end with uh, Matthew Green. Matthew's a second year student here at Osbit in our JD. He's been working with uh, Professor Tungi Renault, who started us off in consulting various organizations on the topic of the Act, the Emergencies Act, and potential legal challenges to the, its invocation. And um, we asked him if he would uh, sort of uh, talk to us about a law student's perspective on emergency litigation now that he's been in the middle of it uh, for the last few weeks. Matthew. Thanks, Craig. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, so like Craig said, I've been working with Professor Tungi Renault over the past couple of weeks. And as a law student, it's been a really uh, exciting and thought-provoking experience. Um, legal education is, I think, often, it's fair to say, often criticized for being highly theoretical and somewhat detached from um, legal practice. And so this work and the exposure I've had through the work has kind of given me an opportunity to reflect a bit on how judicial review of government action actually unfolds or doesn't uh, in practice, especially in an emergency scenario. Um, so a couple of points I wanna make about that. The first is just uh, some logistical concerns around emergency challenges generally, and then some of the kind of to me, interesting more PR issues that I think have arisen out of um, these challenges specifically. Um, so yeah, first, I'll, I think challenges to emergency legislation generally, it's probably fair to say, are happen in a time crunch. Um, you know, governments often responding quickly to a live situation. Uh, and so it needs to have access to powers quickly. On the other hand, the justice system isn't exactly known for speed and efficiency. 
So emergency litigation uh, and emergency lowering are probably a bit of a different paradigm uh, than normal. And in this case, I mean, this is a really complex question on a statute that's never been uh, subject to any judicial commentary. And there are lots of open questions that all need to be resolved really quickly. So, you know, there are substantive legal questions, which some of the other panelists have spoken to about whether thresholds are met under the act um, and what kind of deference is owed to government's declaration of an emergency under the constitution. Um, but there are also really complex procedural questions, I think, that come up um, for potential applicants. So, you know, questions about how to frame the challenge, um, whether there should be a request for an injunction, uh, in which court the challenge should be brought and what the judges are like in that court. Those are questions that any applicant obviously would face, but when the timeline is a week, uh, it's different. And um, I know Professor Ryder was speaking a little bit about uh, charter grounds. And, you know, that's, that's another question that I think applicants have had to consider is, is it worth including a challenge on charter grounds? Because, you know, in that case, you need to choose a particular government action that needs to be challenged. And if you're claiming a remedy, then you need to also decide um, if you have an applicant whose rights have actually been infringed, who could claim that remedy. And, uh, you know, that might be difficult to find, again, when the timeline is so short. And so that might be concerning if we think that we don't want to disincentivize charter challenges uh, in emergency contexts. Uh, and then there's the question of just how quickly the application can be brought. Um, you know, the chances are, I mean, I guess the declaration just was invoked, or sorry, revoked. Um, and so that means that now the likelihood that the court is going to meaningfully engage in meaningful review is maybe different. I don't think it's determinative, but it's definitely relevant. Uh, the second thing I want to talk a little bit about is uh, the sort of public angle of this. So, <clears throat> you know, on one hand, um, what I think challengers are going to want to argue is that this invocation of the act is setting a dangerous precedent, that it's paving the way for the act to be invoked by the federal government anytime there's mismanagement of a crisis on the part of cities, provinces, or police forces. So, you know, those bodies had the power to address it, they just didn't use it uh, properly. And that's a valid concern. I mean, I think everyone can understand that the pandemic has normalized the use of emergency powers, as other panelists have said. And even if we think these limits are justified, that normalization is potentially subtle and maybe pernicious. Um, but I think we do have to be careful in arguing that police necessarily mismanage the situation, or at least going too deep into that argument, um, because of what that might suggest about how protests should be managed by police in the future. Um, you know, if, if it leads to a conclusion that police should have less discretion regarding the enforcement of laws and bylaws, or that they should mobilize more quickly and decisively when protests are loud or disruptive of businesses or when residents say that they feel unsafe. Um, you know, there's room to argue that tailoring police discretion on law enforcement to the situation is always going to be complicated and that, you know, maybe that's conceptually distinct from uh, this question of whether centralizing powers in the hands of the federal government is justified under the act. But, you know, conceptually distinct doesn't necessarily mean practically or politically distinct. And if there's the possibility um, that this mootness issue is going to, again, reduce the ability of the courts to review the exercise of power under the act, then I think it's worth thinking critically about the costs and benefits of such a challenge, um, if it's going to bring into question this idea of police management. And that's that's all my time. Thanks. Wonderfully uh, introspective and, and uh, helpful comments. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so we we have a, we're a little bit like 10 minutes behind where I thought we might be. Uh, so we do have about 35 minutes now where uh, we can go back to everybody who's sort of heard quite a bit and um, are going to be welcome as our contributors to add whatever they want. Uh, by way of even asking questions to somebody else or um, I did want to, I, I'm not going to speak as such, there's too many things that I would say and I go on forever, but I, I did want to uh, respond briefly to Kent's question about where the NDP was in all this. So um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, and and the, the reason he's asking me is I, I, I had the privilege to be an MP for, for four years uh, with that party. And uh, indeed, democratic and parliamentary reform was my brief, and uh, all of these things matter to me a lot. Um, the thing that became clearest to me is, in reading all of the debates, 
uh, and seeing how my colleagues and then people elected after me, I never knew colleagues, were arguing the case. I mean, it was quite obvious that um, uh, politicians deal with generalities. There's a lot of generalities. People seized on different things. It wasn't as if the act was being interpreted in any nuanced fashion. Uh, and I think that's a given. You have to understand that that's what politicians do. And that's one reason why there is a role for judicial review and why I think the general tendency for extreme deference in emergency situations is a 50 year old trope and that we need to have um, a more rigorous understanding of when judges come in and actually can start looking at least within a, a rigorous idea of reasonableness because parliament is not equipped to make these kinds of judgments where facts do matter and where legal interpretation does matter. Uh, the second thing, Craig, can I, can I just ask a, a quick follow up? Because I, yeah. I've just read in the press that Senator Dalfon said he wasn't going to support it. Um, do you, do, he's a, do form, you think he's a former judge. Yeah. Do, I mean, I mean, do, do you think it's a foregone conclusion that the Senate would have approved it? Uh, that I don't know. Uh, but uh, let me think about that a bit more. But the, the point I wanted to end with, so I don't take up too much more time, is what most uh, struck me in the uh, as Monday unfolded and then the vote was how the prime minister turned it into a not just behind the scenes but into a confidence vote and to me that showed all the problems of anything other than a ritualistic understanding of parliament as the seat of democracy it was a party line vote anyway it was going to be mostly part of that party line vote uh, for all kinds of reasons that were political right um, but then you have the, the idea that something like this where you'd think is almost one of the classic examples of which when an MP should be able to exercise their own conscience or at least not be told they're gonna to bring down the government and have an election, this would be it. And so I have to, so Joel, uh, I don't know, is it Joel Lipam or is it the Joel Lightbound? I'm not sure his name, he's a Quebec MP who basically on the record has said in the house, I would be voting against this liberal MP but for it now being made a vote of confidence. And I don't want election. My MP here, Nate Erskine Smith said exactly the same thing. And so for me, that's a kind of an extra, uh, an, uh, an extra legal factor that we should think about as lawyers, uh, about the kind of uh, doctrinal reverence we give to parliament when, when these are part of the factors. I personally think it was an abuse by the prime minister to do this. Um, he was trotting along nicely with a minority parliament finding another party to support him. Uh, and then he did this. And, and I think it just completely mucked up the sincerity with which one can look at that vote. Um, and I will go on record as saying I'm highly dubious. I do not see how the, uh, the public order test could be met. I'm not sure I would have, as a wisdom point, thought it was a good idea at that point in time. I thought slowly was heading in this direction anyway, with the policing side, it was all about to crystallize before he resigned. Um, I would have had a lot of different judgment things, but frankly, I just don't think that the act is made for purpose with one big caveat. If there's a, if there was a lot more evidence that I didn't know about and that I was told there is, and I had to take a flyer on and say, okay, I have to believe you, then possibly I would act on that basis. So who knows what Jagmeet Singh as our the leader of the party was told by the prime minister. So that's all I can say on that. But I might've been in a very awkward position. Um, and when I was an MP, I only threatened to resign and, uh, um, at both my, uh, as critic and possibly would mean I would have been ousted from the caucus on one point that came close to these kinds of issues. Um, and I'm not sure this would have been one or not, I have to be honest. Um, so um, the, uh, let's go back. So uh, Francois is hanging in the wings, um, but we, I wanted to go back to, and Christine has left us, but I wanted to start with Eric and just let's go through the, you know, by the board, so to speak, and see, Eric, do you have any thoughts for us? We collectively now have 30, 30 minutes left. Well, I won't take uh, too long. Thanks uh, for all those insightful comments and uh, learned a lot uh, listening. You know, the last 
uh, three days remind me a little bit of the Seinfeld joke uh, where he talks about how at the end of the meal, you get the bill and you think, who ordered all this food? Um, uh, we're not hungry at all. Um, and uh, you know, it doesn't seem like an emergency anymore uh, because the emergency ended. Uh, and I wonder if the, the, that doesn't seem quite the case on February the 14th. So what I would just remind uh, people of in terms of February 14th is that in addition to being my wife's birthday, which is the double Valentine's <laughs> spousal birthday, I don't know if that's good or bad, but there it is. I've also got the invocation of the Emergencies Act to handle as a constitutional scholar. You can pity me if you want. Um, but we have at least three international borders uh, blocked with every indication from those blockades that they have no intention of moving and intelligence that at least in at least one of those blockades, there is a serious arsenal of weapons. Now, I don't know, but I, I su highly suspect that they will, the government will have evidence of some loose, loose, but nonetheless significant coordination and conversation between those blockades and whatever loose structures of leadership existed in Ottawa. And the other thing I think that is fair to point out is that at some point, the duration of these events, both the occupation of Ottawa and the closure of these borders, stopped being expressed in days and became expressed in weeks. And when that occurred, when we tipped over from days to weeks, and when it became clear that the, the financing and the mobility of these protests were unique to this particular situation, uh, then I think the federal government had to and did seriously consider, obviously carried through with the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Um, like I think if I understood uh, uh, Bruce Ryder on this point, I'd be surprised if a court, after looking at all the evidence, is able to find grounds that it was unreasonable on the terms of the act to have invoked it. Of course, that may occur. I'd be surprised if that occurs. Where I think there is real constitutional vulnerability is in the breadth of the orders that the government enacted uh, under that power. And I think they did so uh, precipitously, and I think they did so in an overbroad manner. I would not have drafted the orders in the form that they uh, did. I suspect there will be some um, judicial comment on uh, the overbreadth in those regards. But on the pure question of whether or not a court is willing to say that there just this simply wasn't an emergency, um, I, I'd be willing to bet that, uh, from what I know, that um, that, that will be a hard uh, a sell in a Canadian court. Maybe I'll leave it there. Thank you, Eric. And just a quick, um, one of the things that I noticed in a lot of the discourse was uh, both the government and others seemed to be wanting to get to certain measures. Um, and it was kind of, they were kind of bootstrapping, okay, look, let's not get too textual about the public order, but if we have these measures and you're focusing on the financial ones we're much more likely to be able to roll this thing up because of how we can exert pressure through the measures along with what's going to happen on the ground with the police um and uh so you know i i think you're you're right i just sort of as the as the legalist side of me i i have without knowing more evidence i would i still would have a hard time with the threshold um next person corey Thanks so much. Um, you know, what a what a great conversation. Um, I mean, my my interest here is uh, I think narrower uh, than than most, but you know, it really strikes me the ways in which um, the conversations that we're having now in this context, um, you know, are so in some ways counter to what um, you know my clients experience, what Indigenous peoples across Canada um, experience. You, it, it's that an injunction was that the multiple injunctions were sought and granted was seen here as being a big step, a, a wow, we've really reached that point. Um, but it strikes me that it took an individual resident of Ottawa, a young public servant, uh, and a, a really great lawyer, uh, Paul Champ, um, to get that first injunction and that it wasn't the government, whether it be the federal government or municipal government or whoever it might have been, 
uh, that went and sought that injunction. Uh, because uh, looking at this from an Indigenous perspective, um, we've seen time and time again that when Indigenous peoples protest, governments, police, corporations are quick to run to court. I mean, there's there's no, you know, sitting around and waiting. Um, uh, the injunctions come quick and they come clear. Um, they're the norm. Uh, I'm putting, I'm going to put in the chat a link to um, a graphic that uh, the Yellowhead Institute uh, at Ryerson uh, published a couple of years ago as part of their report called Land Back. Um, and it's a study of injunctions uh, by and for, uh, for Indigenous peoples, First Nations in particular. And what the Yellowhead Institute found is that um, uh, 90 percent of injunctions sought by governments against First Nations, 81 percent of injunctions sought by corporations against First Nations were granted, while 81 percent of injunctions sought by First Nations were denied. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at the back to what I was saying earlier, the you know, the ways in which the rule of law are deployed, um, you know, the fact that, you know, some of the others on the in the roundtable here have been talking about the Emergencies Act, you know, loosening and, you know, maybe being more likely to be applied in the future. You know, when we're looking at this from the perspective of perspective of Indigenous protests, it's hard to imagine things getting worse from the perspective of unequal enforcement. Um, we're already there. Uh, indigenous peoples dealing with injunctions face challenges securing standing to defend themselves, uh, affording lawyers to def defend their interests, um, and convincing courts that their Aboriginal and treaty rights should be given deference over the economic interests of those against whom they're protesting. Um, you know, I can talk about the KI-6, uh, the Wet'suwet'en and Ferry Creek protesters, 1492 Land Black Lane. Um, these are all protests that um, engage economic interests, um, but not existential economic interests. Are you you're done, Corey? Sorry, um, I just I, I had some background noise there. Um, it was uh, confusing. Um, anyways, the, it engages economic interests, not existential economic interests. Um, uh, and not critical infrastructure or the health and safety in the same ways that um, these protests were alleged to have affected. So, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll end by saying, talking about um, a former Supreme Court Justice uh, Abella uh, uh, in her sort of retirement speech talked about changing the rule of law to the rule of justice. Um, and I mean, I'm a big fan of Justice Abella, but I'm not sure that that solves the problem of partisanship of the rule of law. It just maybe makes it something more amenable to my kind of partisanship. Um, but I think we do have a problem with the rule of law. I think we have a problem with the way that the courts treat the rule of law, with the way that um, the law enforcement looks to the rule of law. Um, and I think this goes to what some of my uh, colleagues on the panel um, have been talking about today, that the, the um, hyper-partisanship and divisions that we're seeing are going to make equitable applications of the rule of law even more difficult than they already are. And I think that's something that we need to start thinking um, really seriously about. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, Jennifer, we're, um, were you interested in adding or Monique? Hi, Craig. Thank you, Inless. Oh. No? You go ahead. Go. And Jennifer, Jennifer's probably uh, a marshal. No, J Jennifer again has a microphone problem, the same as earlier. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you were able to fix that last time, but Monique, would you like to go ahead first? Yeah, why don't I go ahead and I'll give Jen a minute to um, get that fixed. I, I was just going to speak um, briefly just about the idea that um, I hope I hope it's not controversial that the um, people of Ottawa suffered some harm during the three weeks of the occupation in Ottawa and that um, with all of the orders uh, made um, and the declaration of emergency, um, none of those, uh, they, um, the intent of course was to stop the behavior which did occur thankfully. But in terms of a remedy, 
for the harm of the um, of the people who live in Ottawa. The one order that we're hopeful in any event um, that will help to uh, to to ensure that there is a remedy for the people of Ottawa is the Mariba injunction. So a little bit different than um, everything else we've been talking about today. And as I said uh, in the first portion, uh, it was a question uh, Justice McLeod had is whether the Mariba injunction was necessary in light of the other measures that were in place. And, um, and he was satisfied um, that it was necessary exactly for that reason, because um, it is a civil action, it's a civil proceeding by um, uh, representative plaintiffs to freeze very specific assets in order to preserve that fund. Um, so that if and when there's a time to execute, there's actually a fund against to which to execute um, that civil judgment for, for damages. So um, it's been fascinating listening to um, everyone today about the, the constitutional issues, but of course, um, civil remedies matter too, so that there is uh, a way to um, uh, ensure that there can be a judgment at the end of the day uh, for the plaintiffs who suffered harm. So I'll just leave it at, at that. Jennifer, did we get you back online? Jen? Yes. Sorry about can that. you hear me? No, that's yes. okay. I probably joined incorrectly. So I'll, I'll just make a couple of points. Um, I think that um, one of the questions that was raised uh, by the, th there were a number of uh, respondents or people who appeared to speak for the defendants or the respondents in the injunction in Windsor. Um, none of the defendants uh, uh, appeared or had representation, but there were a number of funds uh, that where lawyers showed up and in one case uh, got intervener status as a friend of the court. And one of the arguments that came up was, why do you also need an injunction? Um, isn't what's happening at the Ambassador Bridge already breaching other laws? Aren't there other tools that the, that the police have? Um, and, and I think uh, that was raised and it's dealt with in Chief Justice Morowitz's reasons, um, as I've already mentioned, but it's also important to note that with an injunction, I know Monique talked about remedies, um, there are other enforcement. So, you know, we've already talked about how these municipal bylaws that are being breached are presumptively valid, and so we don't have to get to the point even of balancing. Is, are they being breached? And in this case, we have uh, an injunction where if the uh, if the orders are breached, there's remedies both under criminal law. So it's a breach. Uh, if you breach the order, it can be um, a charge under the criminal code, section 127. And you can also access the under rule 60, the contempt proceedings under the uh, rules of civil procedure. And those can be really quite powerful, uh, the contempt proceedings. Um, which can also uh, result in imprisonment, fines, and other types of orders. So there, these are it's an important tool uh, to to access different types of enforcement powers and remedies through the courts. Um, I, I think also. Uh, Professor Scott, you'd asked whether or not the declarations of emergency were relevant or changed the the arguments before the court. Including the provincial one. Yeah. Including the provincial one. So the provincial declaration, I believe, was the day before we argued the, the injunction on the 11th. Am I right? I think that's right. It, it yeah, did not impact. Yeah. yeah, it did not impact the arguments. Um, and uh, and same is true for the declaration of an emergency federally. Uh, it, we certainly submitted it in the factum as evidence of the continuing risk. Um, but what's important to note about this injunction, as I've already mentioned, it was, uh, it was we granted before uh, the federal declaration of an emergency and will continue indefinitely. So after, obviously, de the declaration is revoked. So I, I think they were, they were relevant from an evidentiary standpoint, but did not change the legal arguments. I don't know That's if you have any the, other questions. No, I think Francois wanted to come in because the, the absence of any other law issue within the Emergencies Act itself, all of this flows into to that. I think he's keen to talk on that. The, the history of review of emergency powers across the globe is not in favor of judicial review, right? So courts tend to exercise very light touch. Most recently, we saw that happen around the time, I mean, in the Western world around around September 11th and, and the kind of measures that were adopted often detention of, the, of people in, in conditions mm -hmm. that were different than otherwise, Guantanamo, you know, Belmarsh prison in, in, in the UK. Um, the courts in, in both the UK and the US in, in those situations did exercise some review, but it was it was very light touch, right? Um, 
but we're not dealing, we're dealing with a different kind of emergency here that might mean something different here, but it, it's still the case that the Emergencies Act is a last resort. I mean, there, there are other extremely muscular um, sort of things included in our law. The National Defense Act could be invoked, right, as a means of getting the, the army involved. But the, one of the questions would be, well, even if the court is not willing to um, overturn the judgment the parliament, the, the, the executive parliament ju judgment that there was an emergency, we need some statutory interpretation here because there are indeed certain criteria. And if you look at the Hansard, you see that the minister who introduced the act, Perrin Didi at the time, Minister of National Defense, made clear that certain things were included in the act to facilitate review and not just review in the context of an emergency, but also judicial review. The idea of a reasonable basis, right? For example, in the act was exactly referred to by the minister as being that. Let's comfort the public and say they'll be able to go to court if they're not happy. Uh, you have criteria, for example, the context of a public emergency requiring that the situation be one that cannot be effectively uh, be dealt with uh, under any other law of Canada. What does that mean, right? Do we do we just give deference and say, well, the, the government thought that? Well, there's a criteria there, right? So it's going to be interesting to see whether the courts are willing to pronounce themselves on this because while well, many commentators are saying the laws of Canada, that means federal law. My view, that's not the case, right? And the provincial law could also be the case. But even in the context of federal law, well, you have a bunch of criminal powers, you have a bunch of exigent circumstances, um, sort of search and seizure, seizure powers that are contemplated by the criminal code and by the common law that could have been invoked, right? A bunch of criminal offenses that could have been enforced earlier that simply were not, right? So one problem here seems to be that there was reluctance to invoke those powers. Now, can the government bootstrap itself into an emergency by saying, well, you know, we didn't act early enough and now it is an emergency. What, how does that color their argument, right? So is there some kind of estoppel argument that can be made in that context? And then if we move to the, the realm of provincial, provincial law, well, here we see, right, municipal injunctions being invoked and other things that we've talked about, um, about today. And it's also the case that provinces can invoke their own emergency legislation within their spheres of uh, competence. Should that be part of other laws of Canada? In my view, it can, because it's first and foremost within the, the sphere of competence of the province. And when we're talking about Ontario, for example, in this case, there was an emergency in place to deal with the situation. Right. So, so the courts have a lot of things to say, even if they don't invalidate the declaration per se. I think I'm hoping that we're going to end up with a judge in the federal court that's willing to, you know, go on the limit a little bit and talk to us about, you know, what these things mean. And I think that's going to be important for the future because the last thing you want to see is the emergencies act not becoming not, not being used as a last resort, but being incre incrementally, uh, incremental, incrementally, sorry, invoked as we face, you know, different things coming from climate change or like tensions around our borders, um, and God forbid, uh, worse kinds of emergencies. Thank you, Francois. And Kent, I, I, Kent, Brendan, and Gus, who are left, uh, and Kent, uh, is there any way, unless you had something you're going to focus on, th one of the big missing pieces in most people's understanding is what was already available, but maybe not yet either acted on or not yet ready to be used at, at the level of inter-organizational policing. Because uh, slowly said early on, the, you know, I need 1800 people. Well, that's eventually how many police showed up. And then they used pretty gentle methods compared to what we've seen elsewhere in the end. And it slowly had stayed on and there had been no emergencies act. It's not entirely clear to me that that isn't how it would all end. Um, but is, can you, have, can you give yeah. us any sense of whether the policing was inadequate to the situation? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, certainly the planning, I think, wasn't there. There, there, you know, ideally there would have been a plan or at least a germ of a plan ready sooner. And so I certainly heard it said that he didn't get that people, that amount of people right away because he didn't have a plan. But you know, yeah. that that that's a joint responsibility between him and the police service boards. And it, you know, it's kind of ironic that the mayor of Ottawa wasn't on his own police service board, although he did eventually remove uh, uh, the municipal appointment. So I mean I do think we need to get 
uh, the governance uh, of the police right. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with you. I mean, we'll see what happens with the SIU investigations, but it was certainly, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a look like a fairly professional uh, sort, sort, sort of way. The, the other thing I, I, that we haven't talked about, and, but I just want to put on, is um, Minister Friedland did say that they would kind of go back perhaps to expand money laundering and terrorism financing. And, and uh, I think that's something that we want to take a look at as well as critical infrastructure, because there was a lot of debates about this, whether it's around 2001 in the Anti-Terrorism Act, uh, where there is some protection, but a very constrained protection of critical infrastructure. Um, and also, you know, the whole area of terrorism financing uh, is a bit of a quagmire. So uh, I also think that you know, hopefully the inquiry, and I agree with you that it doesn't necessarily have to be a public in, in inquiry with an independent head. They could give it to NCIRA or, you know, even potentially a parliamentary committee. So uh, that's going to be important going forward. So thank, thanks so much for including me. Thank you, Kat. Brenda? Just yeah, wait a minute. Just, yeah, just picking up on... on on, on some of the comments that Monique and Jen were both making with respect to the private, um, you know, the use of the private law to get there, uh, you know, as well as Francois' comments on um, the uh, uh, need to be unable to deal with the problem under any other of one of the laws of Canada, whatever, whatever jurisdiction that might mean. But if you just take it at, at the high level, I think what's important about it is that there is some so, you know, in judging whether this was a good thing or bad thing to use the Emergency Act is through the, again, the lens of, of the effect of disinformation on the large sort of penumbra around the hardcore of protesters that may return in different formats and on different issues on a, a basis going forward based on their, you know, the influence of disinformation on them. There's something very powerful about an ordinary judge applying the ordinary law in an ordinary injunction that... Uh, is meaningfully different in terms of the impact that it has, I, 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 I think, on these folks. Um, you know, those are really innocent, convinced, but disinformed folks that it, I, I think is the majority. It's not the same kind of hammer. Of who you're dealing with. It's, it's, it's a very different message that it sends. It's, it sends a message that is more easily taken seriously, that aligns with their sense, their misinformed sense of what is legal and what's not legal. And the invocation of the Emergency Act plays into that story in a way that disrupts it, right? It says, this is a special law. This isn't the real law. This is a special law that I can blame on a specific person, the prime minister, yeah. who I have a banner on the front of my truck on about already. That starts with an F. Um, you know, and I, I think there's, the certain, there's questions about the wisdom of it from that perspective in terms of the effect it will have in the long term and how that gets co-opted into the, the worldview of some of these individuals, the very fact that the law I broke was the Emergencies Act. You know, it's like disobeying uh, at the risk, I'll try to avoid Godwin's law breach. Um, it's like disobeying the Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars as opposed to disobeying, you know, a run of the mill um, judge. And that I think makes a serious difference. That's what I meant when I was responding to Kent when I said um, there's a separate issue of political wisdom quite apart from a legal conformity. And I would have been struggling with that too, uh, about just what are you granting to certain movements by doing this? I could end, um, Gus <clears throat> raised the tow trucks, which hadn't really come up before. <clears throat> um, and uh, in a rather ham way, when I was responding briefly to Eric, I made the point that there seemed to be a lot of focus on we need to get to a few measure, measures. It's the measures we need. And you know, the, the issue of the trigger is it's like it's a hurdle, but you know, if we have these measures, we're going to be able to wrap this up better. And it, it I think it might it may turn out to be true that even though the uh, the police action occurred in a way that I was describing or asking Kent about, that looks like something could have been done anyway. Part of the evidentiary pattern after all this is, is going to be, here's at least two questions. 
tow trucks. There's a specific provision in the regular the emergency measures on that, right? On being able to basically um, requisition tow trucks. Um, and you know, part of the reports were that people, the tow truck drivers weren't doing it. I don't think it was mostly sympathy. It was they were scared for their own safety and the safety of their vehicles. Nonetheless, uh, how much did the tow trucks coming in play a role in all this? Uh, the final clearing, we'll have to see. The second thing is the behind the scenes financial measures, were they starting to bite with the protesters so that they were all the more ready to be to either to give themselves up or not resist in in you know the strongest way? Did a lot of them drive off because some of those measures around licenses and accounts and things were starting to bite? And so that it was a kind of a sandwich effect on why the clearance went as well as it did. Uh, that will be useful to know. I worry that that becomes all the more reason to do this again, unless the general law <laughs> is changed in ways that doesn't make this an emergency kind of thing. And it has to be really carefully thought through about when these kind of tactics can generally be used or not. Uh, with that, and having abused my the power of the chair by ending, um, I, I did want to thank you also very, very much. Those of you who've been on online with us and have uh, stayed through the whole thing, a good two thirds uh, did stay through the whole thing and we're, uh, we started with about 200. Um, and uh, Liel, thank you so much for making this possible. This was just done over the weekend and um, Monday was family day folks and still, uh, she pulled this together for us, so thank you. And um, we'll confer amongst ourselves as a group and uh, let everybody who signed up know whether or not this will be available uh, online as a kind of resource. But what will be a resource is the Nathanson Center uh, page. Well, I don't know where it will end up, but a lot of documents did get put up there. So it was a little bit of a mini archive uh, already building. Um, thank you so much. And thanks especially to the speakers, uh, uh, wherever you may be. Take care. Thanks, Craig.